Turning Tides is an Antics Entertainment affiliate. You can find us on social media at The Turning Tides Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and at Turning Tides Pod on Twitter. For more information, or if you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, please contact us at the turning tides podcast at gmail.com thanks for listening warning this episode of turning tides contains depictions of war violence death sexual assault and discussion of mature themes hello everyone welcome to turning tides i'm your host joseph pascone on today's episode we will be talking about the disastrous first war of Italian independence and the work it took to rebuild in the subsequent years. The War of 1848 to 1849 proved to be a colossal failure for the Italian independence movement, and the coming years would test the Risorgimento. Italians would struggle to come out on the other end of the violence as a stronger player on the world stage. Piedmont was reinvigorated, and eventual Garibaldi stormed through Italy, bent on conquering the land by any means. Piedmont would learn from its mistakes and be forced to remember its failures during this period. For all of its failings, the War of 1848 to 1849 proved to be a watershed moment for Italian cooperation. Tens of thousands of Italians from all walks of life and from all regions of the peninsula marched in support of Italian unity. Additionally, thousands of Italians perished in the misled armies of Piedmont and the Republican governments of Italy. This conflict demonstrated that the Austrian military was still a force to be reckoned with, just as they would be for decades to come. Joseph Radetzky's army would be more than a match for the armies of Italy. Radetzky's army had just passed through Lodi. Their retreat, for all intents and purposes, was an orderly one, even though the troops had shockingly little information on what was happening in Italy. Radetzky tried coolly to calculate his next move, and more importantly, the next move of his enemy he ordered his forces to concentrate in the city of Verona on the Adige River. Radetzky would use this river and the Mincio River to anchor his defensive line and wait for the perfect time to strike. His army of 70,000 lost an estimated 17,000. In his own words in a letter to his daughter, Radetzky says, quote, I have lost 10,600 men by desertion from the army and 13,000 by being cut off in addition to which I have 306 dead and 700 wounded, unquote. On March 29th, Radetzky received word of the Venetian Rebellion. His communication and supply lines to the rest of Austria were now precariously placed upon a single route, which ran through an area called the Tyrol, near the Alpine Mountain Range. The population of this region consisted of mixed South German and North Italians. It was secure for now from rebel attack, but it could be threatened at any moment by the Venetians, the Lombards, or both. Regardless, Radetzky was ready to hold Italy at all cost, even refusing an order of retreat from the imperial government. Meanwhile, a young Lombardian officer named Luciano Manara was leading an impressive light infantry troop called the Brasaglieri, or sharpshooters, on forays throughout the countryside, winning over indifferent rural populations and harassing the rearguard elements of Radetzky's army. Radetzky knew these complications were only minor inconveniences considering the calamities that could have befallen his men. Thanks to Radetzky's wise and down-to-earth leadership style, the morale among his rank and file was always high. This ensured that discipline and order were the way of things, even in retreat. However, this situation was nothing for which Radetzky was or could have been ready. 
his flanks did not exist, and the territory through which they were retreating was considered unruly at best and outwardly hostile at worst. There were even rumors and whispers of a successful revolt in Verona. If that were the case, the entire campaign would be over before it had begun. Then, on March 29th, an Austrian messenger burst into Radetzky's tent and announced that not only Verona, but also Mantua and Pesiera were in imperial hands. This caused Radetzky to weep tears of relief. The type of stress someone in Radetzky's position would have to be under to weep openly in front of a subordinate must have been immense. Either way, the road was clear for his army and its many scattered divisions to concentrate in the hills and brambles of the quadrilateral before striking back at the traitorous Democrats and Republicans who were standing against them. The Italian people were absolutely jubilant. In almost every city, there were nightly celebrations for the victory in Milan and the supposed expulsion of Austria from Italy. Thousands of volunteers were streaming into northern Italy every week. This sudden influx of people caused an immediate problem for cities like Milan, where the administration simply wasn't capable of housing, let alone training and equipping a ragtag army of volunteers. Regardless, the future was bright. On the same day that Radetzky learned of Venice's rebellion, Carlo Alberto crossed the Ticino River, while large crowds of people cheered him on. His royal Piedmont army was highly trained with some of the best artillery in Europe. It was a compact but powerful 45,000 split into two corps. He followed up by sending military advisors to the new Republic of Venice, who were attempting to clear their mainland region of Veneto from imperial vestiges. There was very little cooperation between Venice and Piedmont overall, save these token gestures, and this would eventually hurt both parties in the end. The rest of the peninsula continued to send volunteers to aid the Piedmontese in their cause. Some did this in good faith. Pope Pius IX, upon hearing the lamentations from his citizens, joined the rebels and sent two divisions, 11,000 or so men north, the papal expeditionary forces were under the command of Giovanni Durando, who had fought with distinction in Spain during the Carlist War. In the two Sicilies, Ferdinand begrudgingly held his position as a constitutional monarch, and he was compelled to likewise send Bourbon troops against Austria. This expeditionary force, which also consisted of about two divisions, would be under the command of Guglielmo Pepe, the same failed insurrectionist of 1820. This was a token gesture of many of the undesirable elements of King Ferdinand's army. He left his best Swiss troops at home to assist in destroying the newly proclaimed Sicilian kingdom and in policing his always unruly population. The other dukes of the Italian peninsula also contributed several thousand troops each, with varying degrees of enthusiasm. The first true campaign of the war targeted the Tyrol region, which was Radetzky's main concern. The Lombard government rapidly ordered the formation of a national army, which was to be led by a former Swiss Civil War fighter, Alemandi. The Lombards had no supply system, few weapons, little equipment, and zero uniforms. It was a complete nightmare to try to organize. In spite of this, the army's morale was high, as many eager recruits readied themselves to fight and die for Italy. They fought with terrible spectacle at Castle Nuovo. It was here that 200 Italian volunteers barricaded the town and held out against the much larger Austrian force. The fighting was vicious. The scenic town was the first to play host to a new kind of war, one based on identity and race, as opposed to duty and fealty. To quote Radetzky Marches, The Campaigns of 1848 and 1849 in Upper Italy by Michael Embry, Castle Nuovo itself was a burnt-out shell. Of 175 houses, only 32 remained intact. 113 old men 
women, and children died, either in the flames or killed by the troops. Approximately 100 to 150 volunteers were killed, and two wounded, with 46 prisoners, one of them being a priest in arms. A terrible and sultry lesson had been taught. After breakfast the next morning, the Austrian column left the smoking ruins and marched back toward Verona, unquote. This was not the march of glory many Italians thought it would be. It was going to be extremely difficult. The Austrians did not simply give up control of the land. The butchery at Castle Nuovo was just a small skirmish to the Austrians, while the Italians were nearly wiped out to a man. Meanwhile, the invasion of Tyrol was a complete disaster from the jump. The Lombards were under-equipped, badly led, and outmanned. The raw recruits performed incredibly poorly in the mountains, and insubordination was rife among the rank and file. In all of their proposed advances, they failed to make any headway. When they were attacked, they retreated. The campaign spilled Italian blood needlessly. Additionally, researching this campaign demonstrated how unreliable Italian sources were. When calculating lives lost during this campaign and the many to come, a number of accounts would list the amount of killed in action as some. Several hundred Lombards at least were killed or wounded or captured, while Austrian losses were negligible. Carlo Alberto, king of Piedmont, was attempting to understand how to navigate the war and his political situation. He convened a council of war to discuss the first moves to be made in the campaign. He had two drastically different proposals before him from his two corps commanders. De Sonaz recommended a drastic shift in battlefronts. He wanted to move the entire army of Piedmont east to Venice, and from there be supplied by the sea. This plan, while advantageous in theory, was incredibly risky. It was very possible supply routes could break down on the march, or that the army would be attacked and held up on the way. It also left Milan and Piedmont completely undefended. The more reasonable plan was put forward by Baron Bava. He believed that Mantua was the weakest point of the quadrilateral, and that the population would rise upon the arrival of the king. Bava wanted to cross the Mincio in strength and effectively split Radetzky's troops, forcing a decisive engagement. The decision was made to go along with Bava's plan, although it was slightly modified. The army would cross the Mincio and demonstrate against Mantua, but their true objective would be Pesiera, the closest point to Lombardy on the quadrilateral. Its capitulation would be essential to secure supply lines and ensure the lines of communication remained open. On a rainy day in April 1848, the first units of Piedmont's army broke through the defenses on the Mincio at the bridge at Goito. Though the army of Piedmont had not been in the field in nearly 50 years, the effect of their attack was devastating. The army swept Austrian Jaegers from the heights, inflicting 125 casualties while losing only 48 of their own men. However, on April 11th, Radetzky concentrated his forces. He now had 32,000 at his command in Verona. The Austrians were now able to operate in an offensive capacity as the Italians continued their advance toward Pesiera and Mantua. By the end of April, the Italians were even closing in on Verona itself when they encountered an Austrian division at the town of Pestrengo. In the ensuing battle, Carlo Alberto would find himself at the front lines and often in the thickest point of the fighting. Again, the Italian attack carried the day. By nightfall, the Austrians were in full retreat. This was truly a great victory for Piedmont. They suffered 150 casualties while inflicting 600-plus on the Austrians. Everything was coming up green, red, and white until the repulse at St. Lucia. At St. Lucia, unlike at Pestrengo, it was an equal fight. 30,000-plus Italians met the same number of Austrians, 
and were thoroughly outclassed by the well-trained men of the Kaiser. Their first attack ran headlong into the barricaded Austrians and broke apart like a wave on the shore. The second was led by the guards of Piedmont, and after hours of dreadful hand-to-hand -hand fighting, the cries of Viva la Italia went up. The small cemetery, which was the defensive anchor of the Austrian left, was captured, but the men were exhausted and many were dead on the field. To quote Austrian officer P. Modin, quote, The road and the lanes which crisscrossed Santa Lucia were covered with bodies, the houses holed by cannonballs, the trees smashed, the church tower pierced right through. It had been a bloody affair, and the Piedmontese had fought bravely. Unquote. Elsewhere on the line, the advance had been completely held up. A counterattack by the Austrians at this point could have swept the Italians from the field. In this lull between attacks, Carlo Alberto, seeing the insecurity of his position, called a halt to the operation. This was, after all, only meant to be a probing action to gauge Verona's defenses. The battle left nearly a thousand Italians dead or maimed on the field, with another thousand made prisoner. While Austrian losses were much lower, only about 350. As this battle occurred, news had just started reaching the rest of Italy about a blow to the rebellion that had been more damaging than any military maneuver thus far. Things in the Papal States were reaching a fever pitch. The struggle for independence and liberal government were now one in the same. The Pope was petitioned to join the war fully and declare it a holy conflict. Pius seems to be a man who was at war with himself during this period. His own ministers lobbied him to act. To quote Pellegrini Rossi, the Pope's prime minister, the national sentiment and its ardor for war are a sword, a weapon, a mighty force. Either Pius IX must take it resolutely in hand, or the factions hostile to him will seize it and turn it against him and against the papacy. Unquote. Faced with demands from all sides, the Pope convened a meeting of his cardinals and delivered a speech, which absolved himself of responsibility and concluded that the Church had no relationship to the war. The following quote from Rodetsky Marches demonstrates the significance of the Pope's speech. Quote, At a stroke, the Pope had declared that the war was not a religious undertaking, and after the fact, that the papal troops had been sent only to defend the territorial integrity of the papal states. There would be no holy war. Unquote. Meanwhile, in Naples, things had become incendiary. Many radicals refused to agree to a constitution that allowed an appointed upper house, and the king would not approve any legislative assembly without the upper house. The impasse was clear, and it erupted in violence, which devolved into a full-scale street battle on May 15th. For six hours, the people of Naples, the Lazzaroni, and the Swiss Bourbon garrison battled for control of the city. In the end, 200 soldiers would be casualties, while upwards of 500 Neapolitans were injured or killed. To compare this to the five days of Milan, nearly the same number of casualties occurred, but in Naples it took place in under six hours. The destruction of the insurrection left Ferdinand in total control. This also gave him the excuse he needed to recall his expeditionary forces which he never wanted sent out to begin with. He still had to deal with Sicily. After all, the island had been in open rebellion since January, with Palermo becoming a hotbed for crime and subversive activity. The reaction to the Pope's and Ferdinand's dealings was swift throughout central and southern Italy. The papal government was falling, and intense civil strife spread throughout Rome and the rest of the papal lands. The Neapolitan general, Guglielmo Pepe, upon hearing word from his government to withdraw, resigned from his post. He then took back his resignation, continuing to march his men north toward the fight. In Lombardy, political firebrands had begun to arrive at the city from across the globe. 
Mazzini and Garibaldi both arrived on Italian shores in the month of May and began a volunteer legion in the service of Lombardy. The Piedmont government did not consider Garibaldi a true soldier. They considered him a guerrilla and a terrorist. They refused to even commission him into the army, instead asking him to take up piracy on the Adriatic. In Lombardy, news of the Pope's allocution against the war, while sobering to many, was not enough to detract from the general mood, and news from the front which was, for the most part, good. The people of Lombardy were so enthusiastic, in fact, that they voted overwhelmingly to become a part of the Kingdom of Piedmont on May 20th. This officially began the Kingdom of Northern Italy, which would grow to include the Veneto region later in the year. As the rebellion continued, elements of the Piedmont army were slowly putting the westernmost point of the quadrilateral, the fortress city of Pesiera, under siege. The city's garrison was a meager 1,700. The siege, which began in mid-May, was to be conducted by the king's second son, Ferdinand of Savoy, the Duke of Genoa. This siege would go on for weeks, as the small Austrian garrison held out against hunger, thirst, and hundreds of projectiles dropped onto the city. By late May, the garrison had nearly had enough, and the commander was about to agree to terms with the Duke of Genoa. Pesiero was about to fall, and with it the first key to the quadrilateral. In the hopes of preventing the city's capitulation, Radetzky made his first move from Mantua to regain the initiative. It was an offensive consisting of 40,000 men. They would truly test the Piedmont army this time. They were initially met with the Tuscan division at Cartatoni and Montanera two small villages connected by an irrigation ditch. The Austrian attack was a virtual surprise. The Tuscans never even got word of an Austrian concentration until the battle was well underway. At Cartatoni, around 2,000 Italian regulars and volunteers were met with 8,600 Austrians. Their violent charge met the Italians head-on, and the Austrians were repulsed several times before taking Cartatoni, losing many men in the battle. At Montanera, 2,700 Italians barricaded the highly defensible houses of the village against nearly 10,000 Austrians. The Italians kept up a murderous fire until the Austrian flanking column arrived and completely surrounded the Italians, capturing a 1,000 soldiers in the process. The two battles cost the Italians 2,000 men. The Austrians lost over 750 men at Montanera. The numbers at Cartatoni were likely similar. The Italians proved they could hold their own on the battlefield, while the Austrians proved they were just as disciplined and ferocious as ever. For now, the Tuscan division retreated in disorganized groups toward the town of Goito, where General Bava was coalescing his forces for the king's command. The Second Battle of Goito was a quick, decisive engagement which had significant effects on the early war and on Italian morale. 15,000 Italian soldiers were engaged by 11,000 Austrians at 4 p.m. on May 30th. The Austrians, again, surprised the Italians, but the Italians quickly rallied and put up a stubborn resistance in and around the heights of the town of Goito. When the fight was at its thickest, Bava ordered the Duke of Genoa to march the Aosta Brigade forward against the enemy. As the attack commenced, the Duke called out to his men, quote, With me, the guards, for the honor of the House of Savoy. Unquote. He would be wounded in the leg in the ensuing charge. But the guards of Savoy carried the field, causing two separate enemy brigades to retreat from the sheer weight of their attack. By the time night had fallen, The battle was over and the Austrians were beaten. After the battle, a messenger arrived from Pesiera. The city had finally surrendered, and the men of Italy could celebrate a double victory. Goito's second action was an unusual step back for Radetzky, whose offensive tactics were always quite sound. He hesitated at the beginning of the fight and called a retreat to save his army from unnecessary loss. He lost nearly 600 men in an afternoon, while the Piedmontese lost about 300. 
Radetzky decided he had to reorganize and launch a new offensive, this time against Venice and her mainland holdings. Radetzky's new target was Vicenza, the largest city in the Veneto, which was being defended by the Papal Expeditionary Forces, who were under the command of General Durando. Plans were quickly drawn up for a 62-mile march, which would begin on the morning of June 5th and end on the 10th. Radetzky, always partial to detail, made sure the march began exactly on time, and by June 10th, 31,000 Austrians completely surrounded the city of Vicenza, as well as the garrison of 11,000 papal volunteers. Within 10 days, some elements of Radetzky's army had marched 100 miles back and forth around the quadrilateral. This took an immense amount of discipline and physical stamina, especially since most soldiers only received a single day of rest in between the bitter fighting and intense marching in the muddy fields and riverbanks. Durando, the papal general, had a huge task ahead of him, but it was not an impossible one. Vicenza could be defended from the area of Madonna del Monte, the highest point on the southern end of the city. Some 9,000 Austrians fought viciously to take the rise. Simultaneously, the Villa Rotunda was returned to the Italians only after a counterattack by Massimo di Azeglio's brigade. Meanwhile, along the heights of the city, the fight against the cliffs and deadly fire of the Swiss carabiners was touch and go. The fighting was so heavy that a retreat was called, but to relate from Radetzky marches, quote, the drummer of the 12th company was given the order by an officer for withdrawal. Sir, in the Reisingers, we only know the assault signal. And beating the assault signal with one hand and drawing the saber with the other, he headed the advance. He proved the strokes of timbre could also be deadly, as Kutnik struck down two Swiss, unquote. The Italians' position was crumbling. They were outnumbered three to one and heavily outgunned. Their casualties were nearing 15% of their entire force. The Azeglio's leg was wounded as General Durando committed the last reserves to the places in which the fighting was thickest. By the evening of June 10th, Durando knew all that was left to do was to surrender. The heights were lost and the city was completely indefensible. At the announcement of the capitulation, there was general anger, but the choice was clear. Out of 11,000 combatants, papal losses were over 2,000, while the Austrians lost 822 men. Any more fighting would lead to the annihilation of the entire papal expedition. The army of the papal states was out of the war, and Vicenza fell to Austria. This allowed for another supply route which Austria used to feed their growing forces. Their army's numbers would soon be close to those of the Austrian army prior to 1848. Rudetsky rested his men a day, then marched back to Verona just in time for a major Italian move against the quadrilateral. News of the fall of Vicenza was a serious blow to Italian morale. With the city's fall, Radetzky could now focus solely on Piedmont, the only participant in the war, save Venice. Meanwhile, Carlo Alberto was hearing delegations from Modena, Parma, and Lombardy, who all voted to merge with the Kingdom of Piedmont. He would leisurely move against the Rivoli Plateau to demonstrate against Verona. As the advance against Verona pressed onward, separate elements of Carlo Alberto's army attempted an investment at Mantua. Alberto had effectively split his army in two. The first surrounded Mantua, and the second dispersed themselves throughout the Rivoli Plateau. Carlo Alberto's army had only marched a quarter of the distance Radetzky's had in the same amount of time. Radetzky would send two corps against Alberto's left wing, which was half that size. This grueling summer engagement would take place over four days in late July and would be known to history as the First Battle of Custoza. The battle began on July 22nd near the monument of Napoleon's victory at Rivoli. The Italian corps was scattered over a massive amount of land, which spanned nearly 10 miles. 
Dissonaz was caught flat-footed by the Austrian attack. He quickly recovered and managed to break up several attacks against his position, mostly thanks to the Austrians' poorly led advances. The first day of Custoza was over. The Italians had suffered just over a hundred casualties, while the Austrians lost nearly two hundred men. Dissonaz, seeing his position as untenable, retreated that night and concentrated his men around the hills of Soma Campania. In a defensive array, he prepared to receive the Austrians. July 23rd began with the Austrians advancing impetuously in the face of yesterday's failings. The plan was exceedingly simple for Radetzky. He would send 14,000 Austrians from the Verona Road directly to grips with the enemy's most defensible point. His men would then overcome the Italian position. The attack was held up until dawn by thunderstorms. It was then that havoc broke loose across the Italian line. To quote an artillery captain, Della Setta, who fought for Italy, quote, At dawn on Sunday the 23rd, a forest of bayonets was covering the plain. The Austrians attacked first, and our troops made a brilliant stand. I had only two pieces to counter the fire of 12 or 14 guns. Piedmontese and Tuscan soldiers did their best, but we had only 1,800 men. We were forced to retreat. Unquote. The entire line was on fire, with smoke rising from the musket and artillery blasts. The Italians were running headlong across the Mincio to the defenses of Pesiera and Volta. Carlo Alberto decided to act after receiving news of the battle. He ordered his troops to concentrate at Villafranca, just south of the Austrian army's left flank. Austria had suffered over 400 casualties, and Piedmontese losses are listed at 300. However, these figures are disputed in various recordings of the event and might be unreliable. Radetzky would not stop. The next day, he would continue on over the Mincio River and follow up his one-two punch with a knockout blow. Dissonaz was given no orders on July 24th. His plan was to retreat from Pesiera to Volta, he believed the Austrians would never try to seriously push the Mincio River. At 9 a.m., however, the entire Austrian Reserve Corps smashed through the river's meager defenses and moved quickly across. By the time de Sonaz knew what had happened, his entire position was compromised. He begged for more men. The few reinforcements he was allowed were negligible, as his corps was effectively split in two. The Austrians managed to cross a major river against opposition and suffered only 29 casualties. Italian losses aren't available, but it is probable that they are also light. Di Sonaz was completely surprised. His corps demoralized and out of position. He needed relief more than anything, and by 3 p.m. it came. Carlo Alberto launched his attack against the single spread-out Austrian brigade, the stifling heat made progress slow, and Austrian defenses were difficult to crack. However, throughout the course of the rest of the afternoon, the entire Austrian brigade, which was protecting Radetzky's left rear, disintegrated. The brigade suffered nearly 1,300 casualties, most being made prisoner, while Italian losses are listed at anywhere from a few dozen to a few hundred. Radetzky had to move quickly, or his entire army would be in jeopardy. During the night, Radetzky managed to move two whole corps to face the enemy on his flank. Meanwhile, in the Italian camp, celebrations were going on well into the night. Based on the number of prisoners captured, many believed the Italians had destroyed and routed an entire Austrian corps. Carlo Alberto even ordered an attack to be renewed on the Austrian lines in the morning. He had no clue that it was, in fact, his entire corps that had been rattled and split. He gave no orders to Dissonaz and had simply expected him to join the battle to deliver the coup de grace. Regardless, as the sun rose to open July 25th, a single Italian corps stood staring at three full Austrian corps. Not only were they caught off guard, they soon realized they had only a single avenue of retreat. To compound this problem, the army's commiserat completely broke down on this day. 
soldiers could not and would not eat regularly again. Soldiers throughout history have endured incredible punishment. Some fight with no shoes. Some fight even without ammunition. There is no army anywhere that has fought well without food. The sun rose on what would be an incredibly balmy summer day. Temperatures were above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The lays on the Italian offensive began immediately as the Duke of Genoa's men were not able to have breakfast. It wasn't until 10 a.m. when the Austrians made the first move. They concentrated a massive attack on the Italians, pitting five brigades against two. They were focused on taking Soma Campania from the Italians. It was here that the Aosta and Piedmont brigades would hold the town against repeated assaults. The defenders were finally overcome, but only after hand-to-hand combat. In the north, around Monta Arabica, another Austrian attack persisted, but here Italian resistance was dogged. The Italians repulsed four separate Austrian attacks. The Duke of Genoa, who led the counterattack himself, rallied the nearly breaking Italian lines and threw the Austrians back for a fifth time. As the battle raged, King Alberto knew he needed to relieve pressure from his front, and finally sent word for Di Sonaz to get his corps ready to march against the Austrians at 6 p.m. The Austrians' final attack would happen on Alberto's left, and it was with this that Radetzky's plan started to become clear. He was slowly but surely piercing into the Italian formation from three different directions. He wanted to pop the Italians like a grape. The fighting on Alberto's left concentrated around Monte Memor, which had changed hands several times throughout the battle. A combined Austrian force was finally successful in capturing the peak as the sun went down. The Sonaz would soon be able to move out. All was not lost yet, until it was. Prince Victor Emmanuel's chief of staff arrived at 6 p.m. with the news that the hills of Custoza could not be held any longer. The battle was over. The king ordered Di Sonaz's planned assault to be canceled. He requested additionally that Di Sonaz use his own discretion in where to withdraw. This order would be the Italian's critical blunder. The retreat was held together by a small detachment of Italian cavalry and artillery. So successful was their holding action that only 52 prisoners out of the thousands of soldiers fleeing were captured. Losses for the final day of bloodletting at Custozo were high and relatively equal on both sides, owing to the terrain and the competency that both attacker and defender showed. Italians supposedly lost 1,100 men, while Austrian losses were recorded at 1,300. The Battle of Custoza was a complete failure for the upstart Italians. Imperial losses over the entire four days were nearly 3,500, while Italian losses were likely over 2,000. Both straggling and desertion were huge problems for Italian and Austrian armies, but the Austrians showed themselves to be much more disciplined. The Italians were beaten, but they could still regroup and concentrate across the Mincio. Luckily, the retreat was not cut off in that direction, and most Italians were expecting to resume the offensive in some form. They could easily launch operations from the point of Volta, which was supposedly being held by General Di Sonaz and his corps. Unfortunately, Di Sonaz and his men were nowhere near Volta. He was at Goito. He believed his orders gave him discretion to abandon the incredibly strategic village of Volta. He was told to countermarch his fatigued and hungry men back to Volta and secure the holding so that the river line would not have to be abandoned. The king's aide states it plainly, quote, The king said nothing, but his dissatisfaction was plain. He summoned General Sonaz and ordered him to return to Volta without delay and to retake it in the event that it was already held by the enemy. Unquote. The race for Volta was on and Radetzky was first. He sent Field Marshal Diaspre's corps across the Mincio at Manzambano. A captain of Hussars was the first to reach the summit of the hilly village of Volta. He could see the columns of Italians marching that way and sent word to his brigade commander, who then ran forward reinforcements. 
The Austrians would be first, but narrowly. Most of Austria's army was still marching to the scene as Dissonaz arrived with the 3rd Division, determined to knock the Austrians from the heights. The Italian push was ordered immediately, and the bedraggled Austrian troops were in position and pushing Austrian pickets. The fight was bitter and uphill. Austria's few men were holding, but barely. The last reserves were needed to hold the line. All along Austria's line, men were folding. They were on the brink of collapse. Italians had even entered the village of Volta. This is where combat became very close and desperate. Many Austrian officers wanted to retreat back over the Mincio under the cover of night. A single captain passionately convinced the entire force to stand firm, arguing the strategic importance of Volta and its vital location over the Mincio. At nightfall, he was vindicated as the advance elements of an entirely new Austrian brigade entered the village. In the ensuing counterattack, Italians were swept from the heights around Volta, as fighting in the village continued well into the twilight. Dissonaz retreated the men from Volta and called on General Bava for reinforcements. The general quickly sent 6,000 troops to support the next morning's attack. On the Austrian side, the Osprey was continuing the consolidation of his corps. At 4.30 a.m., the Italian cannonade began as Dissonaz was putting the final touches on his attack. At 5 a.m., the Italian infantry marched forward, bayonets fixed. Once again, the Italians managed to take several key locations amid the torrent of musket balls and grape shot. When the Austrians were reinforced further, the Asprey saw his chance and launched an all-out attack on the Italian right, causing it to shatter and rout. This ended the Battle of Volta. Dissonaz had failed. He had to return to Goito and tell his king about the massive setback for the war effort. Garnier Pages commented on the Battle of Volta, stating, quote, The combat was glorious, but the defeat was crushing. Unquote. Italian losses are said to be 682, or even as high as 1,000 while the Austrians lost 454 men. The disasters of Custoza and Volta cannot be overstated. Radetzky had shown more energy and snatched the initiative from the rebels. He had won twice in a week and gained the respect of military officials worldwide. He was a war horse for his Kaiser, and his brutal efficiency shone through in this campaign especially. All that was left to do was to sign an armistice, the Italian commanders knew this. The king asked Radetzky for his terms, but the military commander demanded more than the king felt comfortable accepting. The war would still go on, and a retreat had to be made, but in what direction? General Bava wanted to move south and cross the Po back into Piedmont. The king had other ideas. He wanted to retreat west toward Milan so that he could defend the city. Bava did not like this plan, but finally acquiesced after the king commanded him to do so. The retreat began on July 28th. This retreat was characterized by desertion, misunderstood orders, and wrong turns. Morale was at an all-time low, and there was no cure for it. Radetzky would slowly follow the Italian retreat, and each town in which the Austrian white coats arrived, they were greeted with cheers of, Viva Radetzky. The pressure on the Italian retreat was immense, as flying cavalry columns caused mayhem among the Italian lines. The Austrians even managed to cross several major rivers without any opposition. By August 2nd, the Italians were chased into Lodi, and the next day, toward the gates of Milan. Carlo Alberto had 42,000 hungry, angry, and disenchanted men, many of whom hadn't eaten nor rested properly since Custoza. With this in mind, it's no wonder that the ensuing battle outside of Milan was another disaster for Piedmont's royal army. When the Austrians advanced, they were met with success, pushing the Italians from the canals and stonework houses outside Milan. Wherever the fighting was heaviest, Carlo Alberto was there. Many believed he was seeking death on the battlefield, a better outcome than any peace which implied his defeat. In the end, Italian losses were over 400 
many of whom were made prisoner, while Austrian losses are listed at just over 300. It was only now that Carlo Alberto would accept an armistice. Now that all was lost, and the gains of spring melted into the realities of summer. Rumors and whispers of the armistice incensed the people of Milan, and soon the city was in a fever pitch. One delegate even called the king and his generals traitors to Italy to all their faces. Hundreds of barricades sprang up within a few hours as the population prepared to resist. Many thousand Milanese marched on the Greppi Palace with the goal of convincing King Alberto to resume the fight. Looking into the faces of the Milanese, the king's resolve crumbled. He said he would denounce the treaty and continue the war. As this happened, the radicals conspired to keep the king as their de facto prisoner in Milan and assigned hundreds of Lombard National Guardsmen to make sure the king was quote-unquote safe. Thankfully, more moderate voices prevailed, and a delegation from the city's elite agreed to Radetzky's terms. They would surrender Milan without a fight. Back in the city itself, the crowds outside Greppi Palace were again becoming hostile. General Bava was even attacked by a mob. A group of Piedmont guards had to be called in before the king could reach safety outside of Milan. Colonel Della Roca, one of the king's aides, said of Carlo Alberto that day, quote, We arrived at the Greppi Palace as the king crossed the threshold. He was on foot, deadly pale, and aged in face and figure. He held his sword tightly under his arm, and when he saw me, said in French, Ah, my dear La Roca, what a day, what a day. I shall never forget the tone of his voice. Unquote. At 3 a.m. on August 6th, the Royal Army of Piedmont retreated from the city of Milan. Evacuating with the soldiers, there were some 60,000 refugees, likely afraid of Austrian reprisals. That same day, Radetzky's army marched into Milan, triumphantly unopposed. In the order of the day for August 8th, Radetzky says to his soldiers, quote, You have hastened from victory to victory, and in the short space of 14 days, advanced victoriously from the Adige to the Ticino. From the walls of Milan, the imperial banner again waves. No enemy any longer stands upon the territory of Lombardy. Unquote. The armistice of Salasco returned all conquered Piedmont holdings to Austria and ended the kingdom of Upper Italy before it even began. Almost all of Italy's armed forces laid down their arms against the Austrians at this point, save a few scattered elements. Of these, the most important was the force of several thousand volunteers operating under Giuseppe Garibaldi. He would refuse to accept the armistice of Salasco or any agreement with Austria. He continued his fight alone near the Swiss border. Several hundred die-hard Republicans fought with him, including Aguiar, his bodyguard and lieutenant, and his wife, Anita, who always followed him on campaign. They fought a campaign against an entire Austrian corps for an entire month before finally heading to Rome. In the Eternal City, Pope Pius IX had been attempting to placate his population since his papal decree removed the country from the war. Things were held together by a single man, Angelo Brunetti, who was well known by the nickname Ciceruaccio. Brunetti was a local. He had been a carter and a tavern owner, and was of moderate means. For ten years, he had been the sole arbiter of stability in a city rife with instability. Through plagues, food shortages, and uncertainty, Ciceruaccio was there with the people of Rome. The name Ciceruaccio was a nickname given to him by his mother. It is a play on the original Roman title, Ciruacciotto, meaning plump or of good stock. Brunetti was so well known throughout Rome that Diazeglio called him, quote, Rome's first citizen. He exhorts, he pontificates, he keeps the peace, unquote. He seemed to have begun a career in liberal politics through his business connections. In fact, when Pope Pius IX was elected, he handed out barrels of wine to the people of Rome and personally thanked the new pontiff. 
1848 ground to a close and Italian armies were met with defeat, Brunetti became increasingly antagonistic toward the Pope and his new government, which he considered highly conservative. The government was led by Pellegrini Rossi, who came into power as Prime Minister on September 10, 1848. Rossi was by all admonitions a liberal reformer, who boasted a lengthy career of liberal agitation. He supported Marat during the Neapolitan Brothers' War and played a prominent role in the French Revolution of 1830. His brand of liberalism was not enough for the radicalized populace of Rome, and many fringe elements openly conspired against him. On top of this, there was little love for him from his fellow politicians and senators. He would go on to fight a constant uphill battle to maintain control. He believed in suffrage, but only for those who had the land, the means, and the right to vote. On November 15th, he lost his battle to control the populace when an assassin stabbed him in the neck and killed him. The assassin, who was purported to be Luigi Brunetti, eldest son of Angelo, escaped thanks to the indifference of the Roman population. Within a week, the Pope himself fled Rome and headed for Gaeta. Meanwhile, scenes of popular sovereignty were taking place all over the city. For the first time in Rome's history, universal male suffrage was granted. The Pope called this, quote, abnormal, deserving the punishment written both in divine and human laws, unquote. He forbade Catholics from taking part in the new Roman elections, and as a result, the vast majority of those elected were anti-clerical radicals. In Venice, the situation was not much better. Austria managed to capture Treviso near the Adriatic shore. This loss, while irreconcilable, was not the end. Guglielmo Pepe, a Republican hero, had recently arrived in the city with the support of the people and 2,500 Neapolitan volunteers. He would be given command of all of Venice's land forces. The young officers he brought with him would help to transform Venice from a lagoon into a fortress. Problems were still rife, especially within the army itself. Many soldiers were undertrained and generally unwilling to follow direction or submit to work in the trenches. Politically, Venice had recently voted to fuse with the Piedmont crown. Manin, being against this, stepped down and let a triumvirate of royalist-leaning liberals take control of the city. However, this fusion was over before it began, as news of Salasco and the defeat of Custoza reached Venice. A secret society, the Italian circle with Mazzinian roots, broke into the palace and took the new government's commissioners as prisoners. The Italian circle actively called for their deaths and considered the commissioners to be traitors to the Republic. Manning arrived at the palace and talked down the would-be assassin, stating, quote, I govern, unquote. These words were enough to incite the crowd into a frenzy and end the standoff. Once again, Manin was elected dictator of Venice on March 7, 1849. The rest of Europe was no less violent or chaotic. In France, working-class neighborhoods were in open rebellion against the new republic. In the fight that followed, 5,000 people would die on the barricades, while 4,000 would be deported. This led directly to Louis Napoleon being elected president of France and later declaring himself Emperor Napoleon III. In Germany, Prussia had become a constitutional monarchy after many protests and violent demonstrations forced the kingdom's hand. The king would take the mantle of reformer in order to head off the radicals and appease the populace. Prussia's new legislature was called the Bundestag, and they would remain in power until Hitler's rise in the 1930s. In Vienna, the Third Revolution of 1848 had begun. The nationalist Hungarian leader, Lashos Kossuth, was promising support in the form of an entire Hungarian military expedition. In the Balkans, along the military frontier of Austria and the Ottoman Empire, some of the first instances of ethnic cleansing had begun to occur. Romanians, Serbs, Hungarians and Croatians murdered each other and exterminated whole villages along ethnic lines. Religious and ethnic minorities who had lived together for generations in peace and fraternity were now bitter racial enemies. 
In the fighting that followed, upwards of 50,000 people would die as a result of Habsburg manipulation and political gamesmanship. After the crushing defeat at Custoza, Carlo Alberto plotted to improve his chances against Austria in the future, as he and his deputies knew the peace of Salasco would not last long. In Piedmont, between March 1848 and May 1849, there were no fewer than seven different governments. This constant change of leadership made it clear that Carlo Alberto was not only in the midst of a war with Austria, but also with himself. He needed a military commander who was capable, so that he could focus on his duties as sovereign. However, every general who was asked to take the position refused. The Italian high command finally found their leader in a Polish soldier of fortune, Wojciech Krzyzanowski. He served with distinction in the Napoleonic Wars and led Polish rebels to several victories against the Russian Empire. The radical, Girolamo Ramorino, was appointed to lead the Lombard Division. This was the same Ramorino who led the failed Mazzinian excursion of 1834. General Bava was named the overall chief of the army. He had a less than enthusiastic opinion of Krzyzanowski, stating, quote, they have sent me a pole, a perfect monkey, small, ugly, with the voice of a eunuch as chief of staff. Unquote. Yikes. Baba was soon removed for being generally disliked by everyone, and Krzyzanowski was made overall commander, with Alessandro La Marmora as his chief of staff. The military classes of Piedmont were all called up early. This swelled the ranks of the army to a staggering 120,000 men. Boys as young as 16 were facing the very real possibility of becoming frontline soldiers. However, this rapid influx of troops led to a severe decline in quality and training. This is especially true of the elite light infantry of Piedmont, the Bersaglieri, the amount of time they had to perfect light infantry doctrine and tactics simply wasn't sufficient. The powers that be and the general population wanted war, and the result of this impatience was a poorer army than the one which began the conflict in 1848. It seemed the Austrians wished to resume hostilities as well. They stipulated that any negotiations would be made on the basis of the 1815 Congress of Vienna. The people of Turin were blindly optimistic. They believed they had a good chance to win. The British Prime Minister to Turin, Ralph Abercrombie, says on the mood of the country, quote, The deplorable infatuation which prevails upon the question of the realization of the Kingdom of Upper Italy, of fighting the Austrians and driving them from Italy, has completely warped judgment and good sense, unquote. On March 12, 1849, the Salasco Armistice was officially denounced by the government of Turin. The war was back on as of March 20th. Radetzky's men held an impromptu military parade in the streets of Milan as the news of the renunciation reached them. This was not the same army that had left disheartened and defeated from the gates of Milan. The summer campaign had brought them much-needed victories and experience. The stage was set for what is known to history as the 100 Hours Campaign. Ramarino sat on the Ticino River with his division. They were meant to hold the line on the river, as Piedmont was sure the Austrian army would never dare to cross. Unfortunately for Piedmont, Radetzky and his men were on the river line, ready to cross as the truce deadline expired. Ramarino left the vital river crossing to be guarded by just a few hundred Lombard Brasaglieri under Luciano Manara. As the Austrians crossed the Ticino, they overwhelmed the meager defenses and effectively marooned the entire Lombard division by burning the bridges over which the Lombards retreated. Meanwhile, Carlo Alberto had crossed the Ticino as well, and to relate the feeling in the countryside from Radetzky marches, quote, Met by sullen indifference from the local Lombards, 
the Piedmontese found that the main body of Austrian troops had left the previous night, heading in the direction of Pavia. Far from retreating, the old man had stolen a march and was now moving on the west bank of the Ticino towards Mortara. Unquote. General Krizanowski had to act quickly to delay disaster. He called forward the 1st and 2nd Division to Mortara and Vigvano, respectively. All eyes were on Montara. Its strategic location as a transport hub could interrupt Piedmont's communication and threaten Turin from the east. Here, the 1st Division, as well as the two princes of Piedmont and their divisions, were preparing for the Austrian attack. The Austrian corps under Diaspre arrived around 4 p.m. Thanks to the awkward terrain, Diaspre was able to form an attack column without being harassed by Piedmont artillery or small arms fire. Within the hour, the bombardment began, devastating strung out Italian regiments along the road. After this tenderizing by the surgical Austrian artillery, the assault began in earnest. On the Italian right, the strategic point of the San Albino Coven was stormed by the bayonet, as Italians broke headlong into Martara and beyond. Recognizing that this was a critical holding, the Piedmont Chief of Staff, La Marmora, took personal charge of its defenses. He managed to lead a mixed detachment of 400 or so men back into Mortara to attempt a counterattack. Met with small arms fire at every turn, he was demanded to surrender. The Austrian commander bluffed that he had La Marmora surrounded and had many more men. La Marmora, believing the lie, surrendered himself and his attack column. Every unit inside Mortara was then compelled to surrender. Over 1,500 men were made prisoner by the Austrians. Both Italian princes, Victor Emmanuel and the Duke of Genoa, managed to escape with a good portion of their men. This all came at the cost of only 179 Austrian casualties. The news of the disaster of Mortara reached the Piedmont camp on March 22nd. Krizanowski was at a loss for words, as was the king. When Carlo Alberto was awoken with the news that his eldest son, Victor Emmanuel, could not be found, he simply replied, Oh. Krizanowski had to act. He called for a rapid concentration of all available forces to Navarra and departed to meet them at once. When he arrived, he found the 1st Division and with it, news that Victor Emmanuel was also on the way with his men, alongside the Duke of Genoa. Although Mortara was a disaster, Krizanowski believed his men would make their final stand in Navarra. The die was cast. The final battle of the war between Piedmont and Austria was about to be waged. It would prove to be a horrific fight, which would leave its scars on the Italian psyche for decades to come. Overnight in the Austrian camp, reports had been flowing that only a small force was holding Navarra. The Austrians would stream forward again, impetuously. Only time would tell if the Italian formations would hold. As morning dawned on March 23rd, the advance Austrian columns would quickly realize that there was no small force here. Arrayed before them was a full 40 to 50,000 soldiers. Upon hearing the cannonade, the chief of staff of Austria is supposed to have said, quote, If the Piedmontese army awaits us at Novara, only God can be of any help to them. Unquote. The attack began around noon, and like all the fights in this campaign, it began ferociously. This time, however, the Italians held firm. The fighting for the suburbs was horrifying. To quote Austrian Lieutenant Joseph Bruna, On the flank of our assaulting battalion, there was a house that our company was ordered to take. As we entered the first rooms, a bitter melee ensued. Friend and foe, officers and common soldiers, one side tried to climb the stairs, while the other attempted to throw the assailants down. In a cruel rush, they shoot one another with the rifle against the enemy's breast, slash and thrust at each other, use the corpses of the fallen as walls or stairs to attack or defend those stairs. 
unquote. The attack described above failed, as did all the attacks that Austria had made thus far. It was only after the deployment of the last reserves that the focal point of the Italian defenses, the Casa Visconti, finally gave way. Krizanowski attempted to regain the villa and sent an aide to push the Savoy Brigade forward. The aide, instead of informing the brigade commander, simply placed himself at the head and shouted, Forward Savoy! In the confusion that followed, some men charged and others stayed put, but everyone became disorganized. Sadly, this move corresponded with an Austrian attack that sent the Savoy Brigade running backward. This failure coincided with failures all up the line as men, exhausted from lack of sleep and food, wavered and broke. All hope seemed lost when the Duke of Genoa's division was called forward. Their counterattack would explode on the Austrian right and hold up their entire line. Two hours of gains were wiped away in one single sweep. The Italians were brought back to life as they pushed the enemies from all ends. Only at Olengo were the Austrians holding and slowly reforming. The Duke of Genoa was planning another attack on the holdout village when orders had came from Krizanowski. The Duke was to retreat. This order came out of the fear that the Italian lines would soon become overextended. However, in doing this, the initiative was irrevocably lost. As the Austrians were reinforced from all directions, the Italians could slowly see the rope being tightened. Ammunition for the artillery was lacking, and supplies would not last the night. As more and more Austrian shells exploded around Italian positions, the battle rapidly came to a close. While the sun was setting, an entirely fresh Austrian corps was able to place itself on Piedmont's flank, and the king was again, where fighting was thickest, searching for death in the field. Nothing could be done. That night, inside the walls of Navarra, the flow of refugees was so intense that the gates could not even be shut. There were many reports of Piedmont soldiers rioting and looting, which were completely ignored by Piedmontese officials. Many soldiers had still not been fed or paid, and several would be shot for desertion after the fight ended. A second armistice was proposed and eventually accepted by Carlo Alberto. In the end, the Battle of Novara was a decisive moment for the House of Savoy and Italy in general. Piedmont is said to have lost 3,000 men, with another 2,000 men being made prisoner. Austrian losses are listed at anywhere from 3,000 to nearly 5,000. In an afternoon, at least 6,000 people were murdered or maimed. Carlo Alberto was forced to abdicate the throne and Victor Emmanuel II ascended. Alberto, called the Italian Hamlet, seized his moment only to be overcome by planning and foresight, and would be dead within the year. Rudetsky's men were jubilant. They had accomplished the unthinkable. They crossed the major river, won several decisive battles and numerous skirmishes, and forced the abdication of the king and the end of the war, all within 72 hours. To quote the General's Proclamation of March 25th, to quote the General's Proclamation on March 25th, soldiers, history will not deny that there was no braver, no truer army than that which my lord and sovereign, the emperor, appointed me to command. With sadness, my eyes look upon the graves of our brothers, the glorious dead. Soldiers, with joy, the inhabitants of the country have everywhere received us, seeing in us, far from oppressors, their saviors against anarchy. Unquote. It surely was the most ingenious military campaign since Napoleon. The tactics and stratagems employed by Radetsky would soon become a manual on how to go about an offensive defensive campaign against the hostile populace with limited resources. Back in Turin, the populace was indignant after their defeat. Italy would act by herself was still the cry in the streets. 
Even the new parliament refused to ratify the armistice. The new king was quickly losing control. He even suspended parliament several times. In Genoa, there was a region-wide uprising, which was suppressed by the royal guard. In the fallout from the battle, upwards of 1,000 people died. In turn, Victor Emmanuel asked Parliament to, quote, find me a single soldier who will go into the battle, and I will be the second to march, unquote. The point was clear. No one would fight. And regardless of what the newspapers or politicians wanted, the war was over. The people seeking a scapegoat found one in the form of General Romorino. He was accused of conspiring with the Austrians to allow them to pass along the Ticino. Romorino was quickly charged and found guilty of treason and sentenced to be shot by firing squad. He asked for no blindfold and even directed the squad personally. Many were worried that his Lombard division would revolt. Instead, most drifted toward Rome. This included Luciano Manara, the Dandalo brothers, and his Bersaglieri. Across Italy, similar scenes were erupting, especially in Brescia, where the imperial dominion over the city was just too much for the agitated populace. They rebelled the same day the Battle of Novara unfolded and quickly took control of most of the city. Sent in response to the rebellion was Field Marshal Hainau and his 10,000 men. He gave no quarter to the rebels, nor the civilian population. He fired on any house where enemies were sheltered, regardless of civilian inhabitants. In the rubble that was left of the city, 2,600 corpses were uncovered, many of them women and children. This earned Hainau the apt nickname, the Beast of Brescia. Far from receiving censure from his government, he was promoted to military director of Hungary. In Rome, the news of Navarra sent shockwaves through the Democratic Assembly. They quickly resolved to hand over emergency powers to an aptly named Roman triumvirate headed by Mazzini. This Roman Republic would be considered radical even to this day. Their constitution made teaching free, outlawed the death penalty, and granted freedom of religion to a new generation of Jewish people and Protestants. The ghettos were torn down once more on the last day of Passover. In spite of this, Mazzini did all he could to placate the Pope and religious Romans. These gestures did little to change the Pope's feelings of betrayal, and he quickly called for the powers of Catholic Europe to come to his aid. This experiment in democracy would not be allowed to continue. Already the Catholic powers of Spain and the Bourbon king of Naples were mobilizing troops to reinstate the Pope's temporal authority as head of the Papal States. Things took a turn for the worse when the French president, Louis Napoleon, nephew to Napoleon I, sent 10,000 men under General Audenois to reinstall the Pope's temporal authority by force. They landed outside of Rome on April 25th, and initiated an immediate siege on the Eternal City. On April 27th, Giuseppe Garibaldi finally arrived and was hailed as a hero, traveling at the head of his thousand-man red-shirt army. On the 29th, Manara arrived with his Bersaglieri, but was held up at Rome's entrance by French General Audenois. The general asked, Are you a Lombard? To which Manara replied, There is no doubt of that. The general then said, Whence comes it that, being a Lombard, you want to interfere with the affairs of Rome? Manara saw the hypocrisy in this line of logic and said as much. You interfere with them rather strongly, and you are a Frenchman. Manara, the Dondalo brothers, and the elite Brasaglieri were finally allowed to pass into Rome and join the 9,000 die-hard Republicans and Italian patriots inside the city's walls. On April 30th, the rash Audenois, expecting little resistance, marched openly against the outworks of Rome. Here, his men were met with a ferocious bayonet charge ordered by Garibaldi. This charge completely crushed the French center. Garibaldi asked permission to throw the French back into the sea, 
but Mazzini forbade the move. The French lines were wrecked, and Mazzini still believed in reconciliation with the only other republic in Europe. Instead of reconciliation, Louis Napoleon sent an entire 20,000-man army to save his isolated troops. In this fight outside of Rome, a young Republican soldier called Paul Marducci was killed. After the Pope's return, his mother was imprisoned for eight days for placing flowers on her son's grave. The humanitarian works of the priest Ugo Bassi were also present during this battle. He was an ardent Republican who believed in God's mercy and forgiveness. He could be found on the battlefield, comforting the dying men on both sides, until they had finally passed on. In Sicily, the Duke of Genoa had refused to ascend to the island throne. The country was barely afloat. Crime in and around Palermo was at an all-time high, and the rest of the world had turned their blinders to the plight of the Sicilian people. King Ferdinand, equipped with a loyal army and the assurances of Europe, set out to crush the rebels once and for all. The Bourbon troops decimated Messina. In their letters, they described their march over dead Sicilians and the unspeakable sexual violence carried out against women and young boys. As they closed in on Palermo, the rebels capitulated on May 15, 1849, after which amnesty was proclaimed by King Ferdinand. A bloody lesson was taught to the peasant Sicilians as the first ember of the revolt was put out with a massive fist. The destruction of the Kingdom of Sicily gained Ferdinand the nickname La Bomba, or the Bombarder. No records exist to express the violence inflicted on the native Sicilians, but if the casualties recorded for previous and future rebellions in the area are accurate, it can be assumed that tens of thousands of people were made casualties. After the initial French invasion was crushed in Rome, Garibaldi turned his attention south to the Bourbon monarchy. Garibaldi would smash several Bourbon detachments, causing their main army to retreat as his red shirts and the Brasaglieri of Manara advanced. Back in Rome, the overall commander of the volunteer army was General Rosselli. He was a believer likewise in French and Roman fraternity and imagined a future where the two powers would fight together to free Italy. Rosselli asked for an armistice with the French. Odenwatt, in writing, agreed to not attack Roman positions until the 4th of June. On June the 3rd, when advanced elements of Roman infantry called out to strange figures just outside the city, they were met with cries of Viva la Italia, they must have believed the figures were comrades who had come back from a raid. They turned out to be the advance elements of the French army, who were gathered for a massive surprise assault. The Roman forces were caught completely off guard. They lost several key villas which were littered on the approach to Rome. The most important of these houses was the Villa Corsini. The only way to recapture it was with an assault and some of the first soldiers on the scene were Manara's Bersaglieri. He cried out, quote, Lombards, forward. The matter is, retake that villa or lay down your lives. Remember, Garibaldi is looking at you, unquote. Enrico Dandolo was at its head. To quote Garibaldi's memoir, My brave Bersaglieri sprang forward to the assault, but from the terrace of the grand salon of the first story, a murderous fire was poured upon them. Enrico Dandolo was struck down, his body pierced by a ball. They had the French at once in front and on their flanks, and every shot brought down a man. I could perceive they would allow themselves to be killed to the last man. I therefore sounded the retreat. Unquote. Garibaldi goes on to say that he has seen terrible fights but nothing like the butchery at Villa Corsini. He estimates his losses in the futile day-long assault against the villa at 1,000 of the 2,000 men he had available to him. Most terrible was the anguish of Emil Dandalo, whose brother's death is described above. Emil refused to believe his brother was killed, believing he was made a prisoner of war. Instead of fighting that day, he searched the battlefield for wounded 
and asked about his brother. None of them could tell him the awful truth. Minara was the one who was given the terrible duty of informing Emil. He said, quote, Seek for your brother no longer, my poor friend. I will henceforth be your brother. Unquote. The ancient proud Dandolo family reacted differently to the news of Enrico's death. His two daughters wept bitterly. His mother was dead within 72 hours, and his father brought their youngest child of 13 forward, asking that he be taught to avenge his brother's death with the musket and sword. For those who fought and died in the streets of Rome, it must have seemed as if their entire world was collapsing before them. Betrayed by the liberal Pope, the French Republic, and their own countrymen, they sought to make a final stand worthy of history. The next month saw hundreds of shells brought down on the city every day, as French works encroached on Roman positions. The Roman reserve was now entirely composed of wounded soldiers, who were at the very least still able to stand. Every day, more Roman guns were dismounted and destroyed by the accurate French artillerymen. By the 29th of June, the final gun was destroyed. The French controlled the city in all but name. The Roman Republic was dying, suffocated by the reactionary clergy and the failings of liberal action. The final attack on the main gates of the city was called for midnight. As the French streamed into the city, the charge was taken up one last time by Garibaldi. As night melted into day, Garibaldi was miraculously still alive, but now covered in blood of compatriot and foe alike, having fought in a haze all through twilight. The gate had changed hands numerous times throughout this time. Garibaldi was called away from the front lines by the government to give his appraisal of the situation. Here he was also informed of the death of his friend and lieutenant Aguiar. The man who traversed continents for freedom's sake was killed by an artillery blast. As he lay dying, his last words were supposedly, quote, Long live the republics of America and Italy, unquote. Andre Aguiar saved Garibaldi's life on numerous occasions in South America. He found his death in a place where many of the people he fought with probably considered him less than human. There is no statue honoring Aguiar. There is no plaque. A single staircase in Rome, called the Andre il Moro, or Andre the Moor, is all that exists to remind the Roman people of the gaucho freedom fighter and hero who died to make Italy and Italians whole. As he arrived at the Senate building, Garibaldi was met with a standing ovation and asked his opinion on how to proceed with the battle. Garibaldi saw no point in needlessly throwing away lives in a contest where all was already lost. He famously said, quote, let us take with us from Rome all of the volunteer army who are willing to follow us. Where we shall be, Rome will be. I pledge myself to nothing but all that my men can do that I will do. And whilst it takes refuge in us, our country shall not die. Unquote. Everyone agreed further bloodshed was pointless. All that was left was to flee as quickly as possible. As the last preparations were made, more tragic news was received. Luciano Manara was dead. He was shot in the stomach and died in the arms of Emil Dondalo. His last words were, quote, I will embrace your brother for you, unquote. He was only 24 years old. His remains would not be allowed to pass to Milan for many years, as the Austrian authorities forbade it. There is no record of how many people perished in the siege of Rome, but out of the approximate 10,000 Roman volunteers who fought, only 4,000 left to flee the city. The French entered Rome on July 3rd. They would remain a permanent fixture in the Papal States, garrisoning the city intermittently until 1870. During this time, Pope Pius stayed in Gaeta, 
while a conservative triumvirate of cardinals called the Red Triumvirate took control of the Papal States. They would go on to imprison dissenters, build up the walls of the ghettos once more, and overtax their citizens. Garibaldi made his way to Venice, the last major republic in Italy. He would be pursued by Neapolitan, French, Austrian, and Spanish armies, while his army began to thin. Miraculously, although many of his soldiers deserted, Garibaldi managed to avoid his enemies and find a way into Tuscany. Here, Austrian and reactionary Italian bands continued to hunt down and whittle away at Garibaldi's tired and starving forces. To be a Garibaldini meant death. To harbor a Garibaldini meant death. After an entire month of marching, the remaining troops finally entered the Republic of San Marino, a small Republican city-state which still exists to this day. Garibaldi entered with his bedraggled men and was finally able to rest and feed them, thanks to the hospitality of the people of San Marino. It was here he disbanded his army before taking a few followers with him, including Ciceruaccio and Ugo Bassi. After arriving on the Adriatic coast, Garibaldi commandeered several boats for their journey. However, things had taken a turn for the worse for Anita. The weather of the Adriatic and the swamp-like nature of the land was a perfect breeding ground for malaria. Anita, who was far along in a pregnancy at the time, began to suffer from malaria-like symptoms. If she wasn't fleeing for her life, had eaten and drank water regularly, or even had a bed on which to rest, this story might have ended differently. She refused countless pleas from her husband to leave the march, and chose to stay with him out of loyalty and love. On this trip, Garibaldi's luck finally ran out. The Austrian navy was waiting for him, and had resurged thanks to their Danish admiral's overhaul of the branch. They were forced to ground by the Austrian ships, where a man named Bonnet met them at the shore with a cart to carry Giuseppe and Anita off to safety. Before his arrival, Ugo Bassi and Ciceruaccio were seen heading inland. Anita was now too sick to move and had to be carried by Garibaldi and a local beggar for another two miles to a farmhouse. The Austrians had found and arrested Ciceruaccio and his two sons, and they were all shot by firing squad. His youngest son was only 13, he died clutching at his father's leg, screaming for mercy from his captors. Ugo Bassi, being a non-combatant, believed his life would be spared, but he likewise was killed by an Austrian firing squad after being turned over by a fellow priest. Ugo's death prompted the poor and downtrodden people to make his burial site a place of pilgrimage. The papal authorities, incensed by this, removed the body, and destroyed his headstone. Anita's time was close at hand as well. She had stopped being able to understand her surroundings, and seeing her time was near, Garibaldi asked that she be allowed to go with him up to her death. They traveled across an inland sea to a farmhouse in Mandrioli. The last words of Anita to Garibaldi were about their surviving children, then, for many hours afterward, she became unable to speak. A local doctor had finally come to see her. The doctor, Garibaldi, and two others gingerly carried the mattress on which Anita was lying up the stairs. At the moment they arrived at the solitary upstairs room, Anita Garibaldi was dead at 27 years old. Garibaldi, who had faced continents worth of danger, with his one stalwart companion, was beside himself with grief. At the moment of her death, Garibaldi's stern demeanor collapsed. He wept bitterly and was devoid of all reason. The next day, Anita was buried, and Garibaldi staggered into the countryside, bound for Tuscany, oblivious to the world. <laughs>
As the springtime of peoples drew to a close in Venice, the final vestiges of the Republic were fighting for survival against the much superior Austrian force. The siege, already months long, had been pounding away at the few remaining outworks on Venice's mainland. The primary defensive point was Fort Margera, which dominated the approach to Venice by land. Around the fort, there were several smaller batteries and various types of earthworks. The main problems the Austrians encountered during the siege were the climate and disease. Although thousands of Austrian soldiers were incapacitated due to malaria and other illnesses, they used massive siege weapons to pound the Venetians out of their holes. The situation by mid-May was worsening as cannon powder was always in short supply and troop morale was steadily deteriorating. Likewise, the Venetian government was micromanaging the army, setting up committees and subcommittees to better execute the war effort. This led General Pepe to quip that he, quote, practiced more patience in Venice than under five Neapolitan kings, unquote. By May 23rd, the final bombardment of Fort Margera was commencing. It would be 72 hours before the fort finally surrendered. The city of Venice would now be the front line. The Austrians began firing on the city right away, as citizens ran for cover from the mortar and artillery shells. This continued until June 19th, when a powder magazine exploded and killed many people. It was a huge blow to the Venetian war effort, and it would not be the last. Between July 4th and July 15th, over 11,000 shells landed in the city causing devastation and chaos. As this happened, the Venetian fleet remained inactive and rested on the laurels of defense. The navy was the one segment of the Venetian armed forces which could change the course of the war. Military innovation ended up being the decisive factor for the Austrian besiegers. Two Austrian brothers are even credited with the introduction of aerial warfare. They attached bombs to balloons in the hopes that they would explode and rain projectiles on the city. However, in each experiment, the bombs were safely carried away to sea by the wind. Another innovation, much more practical, was the artificial angling of Austrian guns. Their method was first used by Napoleon in 1799. A small wooden wedge would artificially adjust the angle of the cannon to 45 degrees, offering a much longer range. This effectively turned the tide of the siege. In the city center, where it was once nearly impossible to attack, there were now thousands of shells landing every day. By early August, the situation was beyond dire. Garibaldi had been denied by the Austrian fleet, cholera was spreading in the city, and food was beginning to run low. On August 18th, news finally reached the city of the Hungarians' crushing defeat at the hands of the intervening Russians. There would be no help. On August 23rd, 1849, the white flag was raised, and the dream was over. Manin was able to secure favorable terms. There would be no reprisals. Only 40 men would be exiled, himself included. In the entire siege of the city, an outlying fort, some 1,000 Venetians were mangled or killed. In contrast, the Austrians suffered 62,000 casualties, almost exclusively as a result of disease. The final battle of the First War for Italian independence was over, and the time had come to bury the dead, remember the martyrs, and swear vengeance. The war had claimed the lives of thousands of people. This included civilians, soldiers, and rebels. The Italian peninsula was a wreck, as its major cities were all either burnt-out shells or massive refugee centers now. The time for a new normal had begun. Reactionary tendencies had prevailed against the initial stirrings of liberal government. Italy would not do it alone, as the people suggested. It was clear new allies were needed for the next war, and there would be a next war.
In Turin, Massimo Diazeglio was asked by Victor Emmanuel to form a government and serve as prime minister, and he reluctantly accepted. Under his moderate leadership, he succeeded in not only keeping but strengthening the constitution at a time where most of Italy was running to authoritarianism. Piedmont remained the one constitutional monarchy in the peninsula. During his reign, the increase in Italian culture became obvious. As tens of thousands of Italian refugees from throughout the country worked and had their children taught in the cities of Genoa and Turin. By 1852, Diazeglio resigned and made way for a new prime minister, Camillo Benso, the Count of Cavour, to come to power. In the Papal States, Diazeglio's brother Luigi Taparelli would start to publish the newspaper La Civilta Cattolica, or The Catholic Civilization, in 1850. In it, he would argue for political and moral rights in a religious context. This paper would go on to be published even to this day. Luigi was incredibly concerned with man's role in society. He is even accredited with creating the term social justice. He also helped pioneer the study of sociology. His paper, unfortunately, would go on to be taken over by far-right elements who would print anti-Semitic articles and propaganda, working hand-in-hand with the proto-fascist members of the clergy and army. In Naples, the situation became unbearable for anyone who had an opinion which differed from the king's. Ferdinand would arrest thousands of Neapolitans and send them off to island fortresses. These men were usually incredibly moderate liberals who decried violence and supported moderate reforms within society. The treatment of these noblemen prisoners would cause an outcry from the rest of Europe, which would eventually aid in shifting public opinion toward Italian unification and away from intervention. Manin was exiled to Paris. He was destitute, having given his last penny to Venice's defenses. Upon arriving in Paris, his wife became sick and died. And if not for the kindness of the exiled Italian community, Manin himself would have succumbed as well. He spent the rest of his life teaching and arguing for Italian independence. When meeting with Cavour, the prime minister is said to have written that Manin, quote, spoke of Italian unity and other nonsense, unquote. After the death of Manin's daughter, Manin practically gave up on life and spent his last years alone. He never got to see a united Italy and died in 1857. Garibaldi found himself as a vagabond, living in the woods and begging for meals and a place to lay his head. His only relief came after months on the run when he wandered into La Spezia. Quickly, the citizens realized that having a revolutionary nearby could endanger the town, and Garibaldi was arrested and exiled, banned from the land in which he was born and for which he fought. Garibaldi was sent to Tangiers in North Africa, He began traveling extensively, but his sorrow over the loss of Anita was still immense. Eventually, he ran out of money and had to move to New York City, where he became a candle maker to make ends meet for his large family. From here, he traveled to Central America, where he would gain employment as a ship captain with important cargo bound for China. He would not return to Italy for many years. The Cowards Heroes, traitors, and legends of the First War of Italian Independence helped shape the country and culture of Italy forever. Without its initial failings, perhaps Italy would have coalesced completely differently. Perhaps Cattaneo's dream of a united states of Italy would have come to fruition. Without the bitter failings of this first war, fascism may not have been able to rise to prominence, but perhaps it would have done so with even more fanaticism. Regardless, the shared trauma felt by Italians living during this period was immense, and it would cause a redoubled effort to unify the country over the next decade. Italy would be alone no longer as they took their first steps into the realm of geopolitics. The House of Savoy would name itself Italy's liberator once again. What that liberation looked like depended a great deal on who you were and oftentimes it did not include all those who were being oppressed. But that will have to wait until the next episode of Turning Tides, where we will discuss the destinies which were realized in a country born in blood and tempered in fire.
If you like what you heard today, you can support us by donating on PayPal at Turning Tides Podcast One. Thanks for the support and thank you for listening.